Hey guys, welcome to another video. Uh, this goes along with my Lotus Elise series, and uh, I just wanted to go over some of the odd and uh, interesting facts about the Lotus Elise. So, out of all the combinations of the Lotus Elise, whether you're driving with no top, or the soft top, or the hard top, in my personal opinion, and a lot of others, the hard top looks the greatest. But the only problem is there's no place to store it in the car. It is removable, but the thing is, if you're driving around with the hardtop on, you're essentially running it in a coupe uh, or, or that kind of roadster condition because there's no place to put it in the car. Unlike a, unlike a Corvette where you can put it kind of in that trunk area under that back hatch, there's no place in the Lotus Elise to put the hardtop. All right, next. The body of the car is made of fiberglass, but... It's in a lot of large pieces, so it makes these minor bumps mean a lot of large damage to fiberglass structure, and typically you'll have to replace the entire clam front or back if you have a minor fender bender. Speaking of which, there was a federal exemption for bumpers uh, that Lotus obtained for the United States for import and uh, yeah, so you don't want to get in a fender bender with one of these cars. Okay, the Lotus Elise is a hand-built car, and during assembly, some of the employees sometimes write messages or leave small doodles or initials on pieces that are normally unseen, such as on the inside of body panels and such. Now, I haven't found many or any in my particular car, but uh, yeah, such is life. Now, these air scoops are fully functional. Now, I know a lot of times in cars today, you have these fake grills or fake air scoops, fake carbon fiber, all this. But on the Lotus Elise, uh, okay, I guess it is guilty on the back here next to the tail lights. But all the other air scoops are fully functional. They're used to cool the radiator or the engine for the cool air intake and also for aerodynamic downforce. The air goes through that front scoop, goes through the radiator, and goes up and over the top of the car to provide downforce. It's a combination radiator cooling and downforce in one. So the bottom of the car is completely covered. It's practically flat for aerodynamics to help prevent lift. And so you have a few panels of, of the aluminum that you can remove, but for the most part, besides a few of these little scoops, the bottom is completely flush. So you would probably expect in a mid-engine sports car like this, an exotic sports car that is meant to carve the canyons, handle the turns, and uh, with a reputation from Lotus, you'd probably expect the weight distribution to be 50-50 or darn close to it. But it's actually 3169, which... Uh, boggled my mind when I first found out but despite that the Lotus handling is amazing and Lotus really is among the best in the business okay so kind of along the same lines the tires and wheels are staggered sizes and so you see this a lot more in like really high-end sports cars and things like that uh, or special trims of of sporty cars and and you won't see this on very common everyday cars, but yeah, the front tires and wheels are smaller than the rears. This kind of makes a interesting tire wear condition where the front tires will last almost three times as long as the rear tires. And uh, I can attest to this as my rear track tires, I have to replace them almost three times as often as the front tires and almost about two and a half for our street tires. So, as you expect, uh, with some cars looking like this good, ground clearance might be an issue. Stock ground clearance of a Lotus Elise is only five inches, and this makes it pretty difficult to drive in poor road conditions where there's lots of potholes or steep curbs and big speed humps. And uh, yeah, I've uh, unfortunately had my few embarrassing scrapes. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting one. The lift points, um, 
there's a lot of different lift points on this car and you better read your owner's manual if you're going to jack up the car at all. Don't trust anyone or you might end up like this. Yeah, so you can't typically jack it up on a four point lift like a normal car, but uh, an interesting way to lift it up is using the side lift point, which actually lifts up the whole side of the car at once. Uh, it, since the car is so light, and the balance of the car, it, it really works. And to be honest, it makes uh, doing a lot of wheel and tire stuff very quick and easy. Okay, so we're moving on to the back. And uh, we have the back trunk. Now, it's a key only unlock and open. Um, you have to insert the key and turn it to open the trunk. And then you have to lift it up with your hand. And uh, then you have to use what normally would be uh, the prop stick which I don't use in my car I've had it I've had it removed um, but shuffling your hands a lot to put stuff back there gets a little bit tiresome and and annoying and sometimes I prop it up with my head if if I don't have time to use the stick speaking of this trunk and engine bay since it is kind of one area uh, water tends to hit the engine bay and the trunk leaks. Um, it's not very watertight and uh, you can see these slats just let in water from the outside. The trunk is tiny. Make a circle with your arms. All right, like you're a fat person. That's how big the trunk is. So, yeah, it's not very tall and it's not very big. And the opening's really small. The opening... Uh, makes it difficult to get stuff that would normally fit into the trunk, like a box, to fit into the trunk because it won't fit through the opening. Now, I have and I can confirm that you can fit a 12-pack of beer and actually up to four in the trunk if you're pretty good with, this, with the Tetrising um, and a normal regulation size basketball can fit under there and certain track helmets will fit sideways okay so we're talking about the engine bay and let's talk about this engine it's it's a toyota engine uh it's was used in the celica gts uh and it was also used in the uh, corolla xr xrs if i'm not mistaken and um it's pretty reliable uh it's a six-speed transmission and um the drivetrain's toyota uh it's tuned by yamaha but uh yeah it's uh it's nice because it's reliable, unlike a lot of other exotic cars. Actually, in this car, I typically get 27 miles per gallon with combined driving, and uh, I don't drive this thing like a granny. I'm sure if I drove it like a granny on the highway at, like, the speed limit, which, um, not that I go over the speed limit or anything... <laughs> But anyway, yeah, um, I get around 27 miles per gallon, and that's using the recommended premium gas. It is required to put 91 octane. Okay, uh, let's go to the doors. Um, the Lotus Elise has some weird doors, and to be honest, most people have no idea how to open the door once they get to it. Um, they expect some sort of door handle on the underside, and there is a little bit of a grip there, a little uh, place where you put your fingers but uh, then they just tug at the at the door, um, thinking it's a Corvette. Ha, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but, uh, yeah, so to open the door, you have to look at the keyhole. And uh, if it's in the uh, horizontal position, you can open it. If it's in the vertical position, it's kind of locked in that it doesn't activate the latch for the door to open it. So you just push it in with your thumb and pull it out. Now, uh... This car actually does have power locks as well as that manual key lock. And so you can lock the door and arm the alarm, which uses a microwave sensor to detect motion. But uh, it tends to go off really sensitively. Um, and so I don't like to use it all the time. Um, in addition, since it's a redundant alarm system and lock system, it gets kind of annoying if uh, you kind of forget like which ones you did. Anyway. Continuing on, getting in and out. All right, this is one of the most annoying parts about ownership of the Lotus and a lot of its other 
stable mates is getting in and out. The car is built uh, with an aluminum tub structure, which is just extruded aluminum and uh, bonded together, basically epoxied together. Um, yeah, it's just glued together. So um, while this seems really ghetto and unsafe, it's actually a really, really strong and light crash structure. And uh, so uh, unfortunately, this means that these giant side sills uh, reach really high. And so getting in and out is a little bit of a challenge sometimes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty hard not to look like an idiot getting in and out. All right, so power windows are actually an option in this car. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of embarrassing because um, power windows are pretty much standard in every common car except for the lowest uh, bottom of the barrel models. But uh, uh, I guess Lotus can get away with it because it saves weight by not having power windows. But anyway, power windows. There's only one power window on each door, and uh, you can't you can't access or lower and 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 adjust the the window on the passenger side from the driver's side. Well, actually, you can because you can reach it. Yeah. All right. So starting the car is a little different than a lot of other push button starts. Um, in most cars, you just Tap the brake and press the button once, and uh, it whirs into action. But uh, in this car, it's a little bit more old school in which you actually still need a key. Uh, it's not keyless. Um, so you put the key in, you put it in the on position in the two clicks or whatever, and then uh, instead of cranking it, then you can put uh, push the start button. But it's not a one-touch. You actually have to hold it down while the starter goes until it has started the motor and cranked it over. Okay, so we have the rear view mirror. It is too big for this car. Uh, unfortunately, it, this is one of the parts bin pieces, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just simply too big. If you look in it, the sides of it are blocked by the seats, and the top and the bottom portion is, it, the, just the rear window is tiny, so. There's a very small square that you can see through the back in this car, and the mirror is just too big, which really stinks because the front glass real estate is not that big as well. So yeah, it does obstruct your view a little bit. Now there are some aftermarket uh, mirrors that you can get to replace it, but uh, I just haven't chosen to do so. And so, yes, big mirror. Oh. While we're up here, we have these silly visors. So um, in most cases, you would flip them down from the top. Okay, well, let me just show you. Yeah, so they flip down this way. But the thing is, they're really, really small, and they barely block any sun. Although, if you're kind of on the taller side like me, and by tall, I mean tall for Lotus Elite standards, because if you're more than like six foot three, you're probably not going to fit in it. And even if you're six foot three, you might not be able to fit a helmet on in it. Okay. So anyway, these visors, I think they're just federally required. So yeah, they stuck in these, these silly little things. Uh, some people remove it, but then you have this uh, silver nub. And so I chose to keep it in and yeah. All right. Um, the seats. So the seats are uh, kind of cool, kind of not, because they're really cool because they're bucket seats and they're one piece and they're racing. Rrr, but um, yeah, they're super uncomfortable um, and they're super non-adjustable. Yeah, it's it's just one piece, so it doesn't adjust. It doesn't tilt. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't do more than go back and forth, sliding in one direction, back and forth, and that's only the driver's seat. The passenger seat's just fixed, so they don't have any say. Uh, not to mention, they're super close together, so you'll bump into your passenger very often, so I hope you like them, and I hope they like you. Oftentimes, you'll, while shifting, probably hit their leg or something, uh, especially when you're going into sixth gear, and um, when you're taking tight corners and such, you might bump shoulders. All right, I mentioned the Toyota drivetrain before. And uh, 
because the Toyota drivetrain was originally meant for front-wheel drive cars, um, essentially this drivetrain is kind of flipped backwards, so the shifter is cabled, and it's kind of a weak part, uh, a weak point in the car. A lot of people don't like the shifter, how it feels. It doesn't feel very secure, notchy. Uh, it doesn't have a very good feel, and it, it's kind of loose. Uh, another oddity is that actually the front hubs, um, if you take these wheels off, and uh, there you go. If you take the wheels off, you see the front hubs have axle holes because it was meant for a front-wheel drive car. Oh, hey, no power steering. Yeah, uh, it's not that bad because the car's really light. Uh, as soon as you start moving, uh, it's not bad at all. But, um, yeah, parallel parking and such can get a little bit annoying. But use your muscles. Okay, enough of that. Um, the car has an immobilizer, and basically it's like a fuel cutoff where uh, after a certain amount of time, uh, the immobili immobilizer will kick on after the car's been off, and um, you can't start the car because the fuel has been cut off until you use the key fob. And now everybody will know how to start and steal your Lotus Elise. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but you need to press this uh, bigger button on the key fob, before you can start the vehicle. There's a flashing red light on the dash here. And uh, when it's flashing, that means the immobilizer is active. And when you press the button, that flashing light will go away, telling you that you can start your car. Uh, that light actually has another purpose, um, which is that light will come on and actually limit your throttle um, to a lower RPM limit of around 6,000 RPM if the engine coolant has not warmed up sufficient. That's kind of a smart, uh, smart implementation because you don't want to blow your engine up because uh, you're going too fast too soon before the engine has a chance to warm up. So the normal red line is almost 8,250 or 8,500 RPM, but yeah, the second camshaft profile doesn't engage until uh, usually for stock cars after 6,000, I think around 6,250 RPM. So uh, not allowing you to hit that second camshaft before the coolant and the oil has warmed up is, is probably a very smart engineering move on their part. Uh, one last thing, uh, just look at this RPM gauge. You got the one, two, three thousand RPM real close together, and then the rest, uh, rest is normal. So um, yeah, uh, that's all of the odd, odds and ends um, on the Lotus Elise that I could find. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that video, and hope you stick around and check out some of my other videos. See you guys next time. Peace.